Haggai in your Bibles. Haggai. Is that how you said Haggai? <laughs> Haggai. Haggai. <laughs> Haggai. Only know one word in Ilongo. Mayun Aga. Right? But I do it right? That's the only that's the only thing I know. I know. Mayun Aga. I hear your pastor all the time, but I don't know what he's saying. Uh, hey guy, or hi guy. <laughs> if, you, if you can't find it, if you go, if you go to Matthew and go three books back, go to the Gospel of Matthew and then go back three books, you're gonna find it. All right. In the book of Haggai. Now, I want you to listen to me on purpose. I'm not going to be real long today. I want to encourage you. I, I want to help you. Look up here at me now. If you haven't found Haggai yet, just look up here because you'll never find it. And uh, you just have to act like you found it and just look wherever you're looking. But ha have you ever felt this way? Have you ever felt that I'm doing my best? I'm trying my hardest? but it doesn't seem good enough? Have you ever felt that way? you ever felt that way and you say, boy, God, I'm trying. I'm, I'm working. I'm giving my best. I'm laboring. It just doesn't seem good enough. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about today here in this book of Haggai. But you're going to have to listen because I want to teach you something. You want to learn something? Yeah. I'll teach you something from this book. I saw it when I studied this book. And it's so exciting. You bear with me. It's going to be exciting. You've got to listen to the details. You understand it? It's going to be exciting at the end. Haggai was a prophet to the restored remnant of Israel after the 70 year captivity. Now don't leave me. Haggai was preaching to a group of people that had come back from Babylonian captivity. Yeah. Okay? Don't leave me. If you don't understand, you'll get it. He was a preacher, a contemporary preacher with Ezra and Nehemiah. He preached at the same time. His message, Haggai's message, was a very simple one. His message was rebuild the temple. Amen. Say that with me. His message was rebuild the temple. That was his message, Haggai's message. Of course, the tabernacle or the temple, later the temple, was a center of worship in the Old Testament. The temple was very important to the Jewish people because it was where the very presence of God was. They had the Holy of Holies, you know that, the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the angels, the cherubims over the mercy seat. God's presence dwelt there. Now in, in the New Testament, in this age, God's presence is not in a building, but rather God's presence is in the body of the believer. So our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But back then, in the Old Testament, the temple was where God lived. It was the dwelling place of God. Let me review. When God brought the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt, he instructed Moses to build a tabernacle. You remember that? It was a portable tent. And they would travel wherever they went so God could dwell in the midst of them. We talked about that last hour. God wanted to be with them. God said, I want to be right in the middle of my people. I love that. God wanted to be with them. So they had three tribes on each side. Three tribes to the north, I think, right? And west. And uh, south and east, God said, I want to be right in the middle. Is the tabernacle going to be? Now the nation of Israel has entered the promised land. They have a permanent place to dwell called a temple. Of course, they still had the Ark of the Covenant. They had the other furniture there. Don't leave me. I'm going somewhere. Now it's 1000 B.C. We're going through time. They had the tabernacle they built under Moses. Then they come into the promised land. You know, they conquer Jericho. They have, they have the temple. Now it's a more of a permanent place. 1000 B.C. King David had a great heart for God. Most of you know, you know David, don't you? I mean, know David. Great heart for God. He wanted to build the temple. 
what David wanted to do because he loved God. And, and David said, you know, why should I have a house that I live in and it's got paneling, it's got a floor, it's got walls, and, and, and God doesn't have a place to dwell. David said, I want to build a temple for Him. And uh, that's in 2 Samuel 7, 2. The capital city is now Jerusalem and David is determined and he makes plans to build this elaborate temple to, to house the Ark of the Covenant where God's presence was. But watch me, God said, nope, David, you can't build it. Remember that? David said, I want to build this time and, and I'll spare no expense. Whatever money I, I have, I'm going, to, I'm going to use it. I'm going to build this temple. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be something that, that will honor the Lord. And God said, no, David, you can't build it. Remember that? But God said to David, your son is going to build it. He said, David, you have shed too much blood. You've killed too many people. You cannot build a temple for me, but your son will. And then God does something very beautiful for David. In 2 Samuel 7, 11 and following, God promises David that his kingdom will last forever and that this temple will be built. And God said, I will dwell there. Watch me. God said to David, you won't build a temple for me. You won't build a house for me. But God said, I'll build a house for you. And that's why the Bible says about Jesus Christ, He was of the house of, of David. Remember that? So God honored David even though He wouldn't let him build the temple. i got to hurry. So David, David doesn't build a house for God. Solomon does. So what a house it was. What a house it was. Listen, David had prepared for years. David got gold and silver and jewels, everything the best that he had. And then David went to his king friends, his other friends, and said, here's what I'm doing. What are you going to get? And they gave their gold and silver and precious stones. And boy, they built this temple and it was elaborate. It was beautiful. Solomon built it. Remember, he had thousands of workers and they built this temple. And it took them a long time. And boy, it was just a beautiful thing. In fact... They said if you were to try to reproduce Solomon's temple today, if we were going to build it exactly by the, by the specifications that are given there, it would cost $174 billion. Wow. Think about that. A hundred, that's more money than I got. That's more money than your church has. $174 billion it costs to build this temple. And sacrifices were offered daily in the courtyard. And right in the center was the Holy of Holies where the Shekinah glory of God was. And it was in the midst of the people. God was at the center. This magnificent temple was finished in 960 B.C. But watch me. In about 605 B.C. the Babylonians came. They're about to become the first people to co conquer the world. They invade Jerusalem. They carry away many of the natural national treasures. And and remember they take away Daniel and they take away Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and some of the best and the brightest young people they take back to Babylon. Remember that? Yeah. It's a captivity. They take God's people because of their disobedience. Well, the Israelites kept fighting and finally in 587 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar comes for final destruction and he tears down the temple of Solomon. He demolishes it, $174 billion, and, and Nebuchadnezzar just tears it down. I mean, he destroys it, and uh, not one stone is left upon another. He kills many of the people, and the rest of them are taken to Babylon. Are you with me? Don't leave me. I'm going somewhere. Hang in there. Don't, don't leave me yet, because it's going to be exciting at the end. Now about 536 B.C., the 70-year captivity is over. Okay, God says you're going to be in captivity 70 years. Now 70 years have passed and the people began to come back home. Actually, many of these people had never been to Jerusalem. Somebody's car alarm going off, we'll fix that. Actually, many of these people had never been to Jerusalem. They were born in captivity. But now they're coming back home after 70 years. Can you imagine what a city would be like after 70 years and nobody being there? I mean, nothing. There's no roads, weeds, everything's grown over. Nothing. There's nothing left. And these people come back to Jerusalem. And uh, that's who Haggai is talking about here. Everything is overgrown. But they return and they, they need a place to live. And they begin to rebuild their houses and plant crops. And, and they're trying to rebuild a nation. Hold it. Haggai says, wait, wait, you built your own houses, but you haven't built the temple for God. 
Right? He said, rebuild the temple. They seem to have forgotten that God Himself wants to dwell among them in their midst. But they haven't given thought to a dwelling place for God. So God sends His prophet Haggai with a message to them. And what is Haggai's message? What is it? Rebuild the... What is it? Rebuild the temple. Say it. Rebuild the temple. Your priorities basically set around a wick. Brother Beer talked about he was working with Ezra and also with Zechariah and with Malachi. Okay? Look at chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1. Look at verse 4 and 5. Is it time for ye, you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. In other words, he says, should you live in a house and God not have a house? No, you need to have fellowship with God. You need to have God dwelling in your midst. You need to rebuild the temple. Watch me. I'm not going to all that, but watch. Three weeks after Haggai gave the message to Zerubbabel the governor, to Joshua the high priest, and to the people, the people left everything they were doing. They stopped the work on their own houses. They stopped the work in their own fields. They left the crops where they were, and they brought themselves together to rebuild the temple. Have you got it? Are you with me? Have I lost you? So these people come back after being gone for 70 years. Everything's a mess. And they say, we got to have a place to stay. we got to have food to eat. So they start to plant their fields and build their houses. And the preacher says, no, you got to build the temple first. The most important thing is your relationship with God. And so three weeks later, these people say, okay, yes, sir. We'll obey God. And they start building the temple. Okay, look at chapter 2. Now here's the message. That's all introduction. Here's the message. Chapter 2, verse number 1. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the rest of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of nothing? Watch me. The preacher gets together and these people had come back from captivity. They had nothing. Right? They're very poor. And they come back and they're obedient to God's Word, to God's man. Listen, fellas. Hey, look right up here. Hey, hey, don't talk now. Listen. Listen now. They're obeying God's command to rebuild the temple and they build this temple and they do their best. Right? They're obeying God. They're doing their best. They use what they have. But then they look at what they have. They step back and they look at that temple. And the preacher said, How many of you remember Solomon's temple? $174 billion. And a few of the people, the old people, they raised their hands and said they remember that. And the preacher said, Does it seem like it's, that this one is nothing to you? See, here's this temple they had worked hard to build. And boy, they had given their best. They obeyed God. And, and, and the preacher says, look at that. When you, can, when you remember the old temple, doesn't it seem like it's nothing? Now watch me, I'm going somewhere. See, does it ever seem like you give your best and you obey God and you step back and you look at it and say, boy, it just seems like it's not very much. I'm just not real smart. I wish I could do better. I wish I could sing better. You hear somebody else sing and say, well, I want to get up and sing. And oh, and, and, and Brother Jonathan said, no, no, you, you get away from the mic. Stand over here. And, and you say, but I'm doing my best. I wish, I wish I had a better personality. I wish I could do more. Look at what he said. It seems like nothing to you. Look at verse number 4. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel. Here's the answer. He said, when it seems like you give your best and it's not enough, what do you do? You be strong. Look at what it says. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. Be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. Listen, God says, when it seems like your best is not enough, don't quit. Keep on working. That's what God says. And work. And work. Oh, listen. There's a great principle that's given here. 
Some of you are going to need this now. Some won't need it right now. Some of you are going to need it later. So what you need to do is put it in your mind and, and remember it. Because you're going to need it one of these days. Listen, I, I take my boys fishing sometimes. And we go up to the mountains like you got around here. And we go, we go up there and catch fish. And we just got the fishing pole. We don't have the big nets and everything you guys have. But uh, sometimes we'll go catch fish and we'll think, boy, this is a big one. You know, we catch a trout, rainbow trout. Something. And we'll, we'll bring these fish back to the cleaning station where we fillet them and clean them up. And, and I'll, I'll be so proud. You know, my boys, they're young. Oh, this is going to be fun. We got these big old fish. This is exciting. And then we come back to the cleaning station. And there's another fisherman there. And he says, oh, those aren't very big. He'll say, here's a big one. You know, hold up this one. And then all of a sudden I look at my fish and say, yeah, I guess they aren't very big. Well, I guess I thought they were big. But now this guy, he's really a good fisherman. I guess I'm not such a good fisherman also. And I can get a little bit discouraged. And, and all of us can get that way. Every single one of us in this life can become discouraged if we're not careful. It's the best that we can do, but it seems like it's just not good enough. If you haven't felt that way yet, you will. You set out to obey God. You do your best, but your best effort seems feeble. And no matter how hard you try, it just seems like it's not good enough. I can't build what used to be here. I can't do what they used to do. That's the way they felt. God has a word to say about this. God says through Haggai, keep on working. Keep on working. Remember this. Hear me, friend. Solomon's temple was built in the most wealthy days of the nation. When Solomon built his temple, God had given him wealth and God had given him wisdom and God had given him fame and David had prepared for years and collected all the materials and Solomon built this temple. It was the most uh, wealthy time, wealthy day of the nation of Israel. But now they're coming back from captivity and they have nothing. They have nothing to build with. They're just using what they have. That temple was built of unlimited resources with unlimited labor. The economy was booming. But again, now nobody is rich. It's a depression time. People are working and they're wondering where the next meal will come from. What do you do? What do you do when your best doesn't seem good enough? You ever been there? I remember when I was at college and I would preach. Sometimes they would ask me, I got on staff and I would preach in chapel at college and I, I can remember sometimes preaching, Pastor, and I'd get up and I'd give my best and then I'd hear another preacher preach and I'd say, wow, I'm just not as funny as he is. You know, I wish I had more humor. I wish I could be more funny, you know, make everybody laugh. Then I'd hear another preacher preach and he'd be preaching, he'd sing a song in his message and boy, he'd start singing I'd think, boy, I wish I could sing like that. I just can't, I can't sing as good as he can sing. Sometimes they get up and preach, but pre, you know, preach like uh, the bombastic and dynamic preaching. I say, well, I just wish I could preach like that. God, I'm doing my best. God, I'm preaching my best and I want to obey you and I want to please you. But sometimes it seems my best is not good enough. Here's a bunch of people. They work and they work and they obey the, the man of God and they're doing the work of God and they look back at their temple and say, wow, it doesn't look like very much. It just doesn't look like there's a whole lot there. And there's some people that remember the old temple. Oh, listen, it may be your case today. Some of you pastors that are here, maybe you, you look at your work and you do your best and you say, boy, it just doesn't seem like much. It just seems like it's nothing compared to something else. It's nothing. We work and we pray and we go and we give. And as a pastor, sometimes we, we try to build something. And somebody told me this, uh, Pastor. Uh, he said, pastoring a church is like building a house with wood and no nails. He said, you, you put the wood up over here and you try to set this wall up and you got no nails. And then you say, okay. And you go over here and try to build this wall. This one's coming back down. Put this one. Oh, oh, this one over here. That's the way it is pastoring sometimes. You fix this problem over here. Okay, this family's doing good. This couple's doing good. Okay, good. Come over here. Fix. Oh, oh, now they're not doing good. That's the way we are sometimes as pastors, right? 
You, you, sometimes you look at what you do and you say it's not good enough. And you girls that are here, I don't know what you struggle with. And maybe it's in your service for God. Or, or maybe it's in your schoolwork. I don't know. But you look at it and you're giving your best. And God knows you're giving your best. And you look at somebody else and say, Boy, I can't do what they do. This doesn't seem good enough. What do you do when your best doesn't seem good enough? Yeah. What is, listen, what does God say to these people? What does God say to us through His Word? What if you're tempted to quit? What if you're tempted to say, what's the use? You ever felt that way? Why should I even try? I can't do it. I, I'm trying and it seems like it's not good enough. I'll just forget about it. Let me show you what He says. I love this. Look at verse 4 and 5. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. And be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. Notice this. Here's what God says first. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. God says, be strong. Be strong. Hey, when it seems like your best is not enough, when you work hard, try and you say, boy, it doesn't seem like much. It seems like nothing. God says be strong and keep on working and keep on going. Why? Why should I do it? God said here's why. Because I am with you, God said. Hey, don't throw in the towel. You know what that means. In boxing, if you feel like your fighter's getting beat to death, what you do is you throw the towel in the ring and they stop the fight. God says, don't throw in the towel. Yes. Hey, don't quit! Yes. God says, I am with you. These people were tempted. If this temple can't measure up, why bother? If I can't measure up, I'll just give up. No, sir. God says, work, work, work. Be strong. Work. Don't give up. Keep going. Keep on building. Keep laying one stone upon another. Keep doing your best. Keep praying. Keep working hard. Why? God says, because I am with you. I am with you. When you do your best and can't compete, why even try? God says, don't quit. Be strong. For I am with you. Watch me. God says your job may have evaporated, but God said I haven't evaporated. Right. Oh yes. God says the economy may be bad, but I'm still here. Yes. God says, hey, your spouse may have left you, but God said I'm still here. God says your friend might have abandoned you, but I'm still here. God said your offerings may be down, but I'm still here. God says your voice might have cracked. You're trying to sing a song. And, and your voice cries, but God said, I'm still here. Keep on working. Keep on building. Keep on serving God. God says, I am with you. Don't give up. Watch me. This is great. Look at chapter 2 and verse number 1 again. The Bible says, what day did He give this speech? On the 21st day of the seventh month. Now, how many of you know what day that was? It was a special day. None of you know what day that was. I didn't know either until I studied it. You know what day this is? Every Jew knows what day that is. It's like we say December 25th. Oh, that's Christmas. Okay, the seventh month, the 21st day to the Jew was the Feast of the Tabernacles. Every year they had three main feasts. Are you with me? They had the Feast of the Pentecost, the Feast of the Tabernacles, Feast of the Passover, right? What was the Feast of the uh, Tabernacles? Here's what it was. It was when God's people were commanded by God to leave their homes for a week and they were to build a little shelter, right? Maybe put some brush over the top, a little lean-to. And they were to live outside of their home in this little lean-to. They were to eat their meals out there, cook their meals out there, sleep out there outside the home. Now why did they do that? Because God said, I want you to remember how I provided for you in the wilderness. Amen. Remember? God said for 40 years, your, your forefathers, your predecessors were in the wilderness. And God says, you were out there in the wilderness. And God says, I took care of you there. I sent manna from above. I sent water from a rock. I made it so your clothes wouldn't wear out. God said, I had a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud during the day. God says, back there in the wilderness, I was with you. Hear me? God says to these people, I still am with you. God says, I haven't left you. I am with you. Just like I was back then. God said, I'm still with 
you even now. Oh yes, when it seems like your best is not good enough, God says, I am still with you. God was in the midst of them. God's still with them and God will still provide. God says, remember all those 40 years I was with you? Well, I still am. I still am. Verse number 5. God says, My Spirit remains with you. Don't despair. God says, Fear not. I am with you. So the first thing God says to us when we feel like our best is not good enough. You ever felt that way? Yeah. You ever felt like, Well, I'm trying my hardest and it's not good enough. What does God say to you? First of all, He says, I am with you. Say it. I am with you. What's He say? I am with you. Keep on working for I am with me. Number two, I love this. Look at verse number six. For thus saith the Lord host, the Lord, I'm sorry, yes, thus saith the Lord host, yet once it is a little while and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and I will shake all nations and the desirable nations shall come and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. You know what God says in verses 6 through 9? First, God says, I am with you. Secondly, God says, I will work. Amen. Look at what God says. God says here in this passage, I will work. Verse number 6, God says, I will shake the heavens. Verse number 7 says, God said, I will shake all nature. Verse number 7, I will fill this house with glory. And then verse number 9, the glory of this house shall be greater than of the former. You say, what? This house we're building now? Man, it's only made out of bamboo. Man, it doesn't have a lot of gold. It's the best we got. But we don't have everything they had back then. Hey, God says this house, yeah. this house, the glory of this house will be greater than the former house. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I love it. In these four verses, God uses the term the Lord of hosts four times. Four times. God said, I am the Lord of hosts. I'm the Lord Almighty. I'm the Lord of all. I'm the Lord of hosts. He uses the term I will three times. Watch me. Notice in verse 4 and 5, God talks about this work. This work. Hey, keep on working. Hey, do your best. Hey, keep on going. Hey, don't give up. God says you do your work. But in verse 6 through 9, God says it's my work. Amen. God says in the first part of this chapter, you work and give your best. And then God says, I'll work. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. God says, number one, I am with you. Say it. I am with you. When your best doesn't seem like it's good enough, God says what? I am with you. Number two, God says, I will work. What's He say? I will work. Oh, say it. God says, I will work. work. Don't despair. Hear me. This is what God says. I love this, Pastor. God says because when you reach the end of yourself, God said, I'm just beginning. Amen. Hey, God says when you've done your best, all you can do, God says, I'm just starting to work. Amen. Oh, yes. Don't despair. Often God has to bring us to this point. Watch me. So oftentimes God has to bring us to this point where we look at what we can do and say it's not very good. It doesn't seem good enough. God says good. Now I'm going to work. Why? That no flesh may glory in His presence. It's not about us. It's about Him. It's not about what we can do, creatures. It's about what God can do in and through us. Oh yes. God says then I'll work. Remember, God says, I am with you. God says, I am at work. You can trust Him. I'm saying don't become weary in well-doing. Hey, keep on teaching preachers. Keep on preaching preachers. Hey, keep on serving. Keep on going so many. Keep on singing for God. Keep on obeying your parents. Keep on obeying God. Keep on doing right. Yes, sir. When it seems that your best is not good enough, remember two things. Two things I want you to remember. Are you with me? Yes. Say this with me. God is with me. 
Say it. God is with me. Say number two. God is at work. I'll say God is at work. I'm talking about when you're obeying God and doing your best. And your best doesn't seem like it's good enough. You just keep right on going. You just keep right on uh, serving and keep giving your best. God is at work. It is not about what I can do, but what God will do in response to my obedience. Hear me? It's not about what I can do. It is about what God will do in response to my obedience. God promised to use this, their toil, to do something that they couldn't even imagine. Watch me, and here's the best part of all, and I'm done. God says, I'll use your meager efforts to do something amazing. It wasn't something He was doing for their glory. It was something He was doing for His glory. Yeah. Right? God said, I want to do something for my glory. Oh, watch this. I love this. If you fast forward 500 years, okay, they built this temple under Haggai. They rebuilt it. It's not very much to look at. They didn't have all the wealth they had back then. But if you go forward 500 years, the Romans appoint a governor called Herod the Great. Herod the Great comes along and watch me. He takes the gold and the silver of his day. Watch me now. Don't leave me because you're going to get something here if you'll stay with me. Herod the Great, he's not a Christian. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, believe in even Jehovah God, but God's going to use him. God takes Herod the Great and He gathers all the gold and silver. Why? Because God said all the gold and silver are mine anyway. And He takes the gold and silver of His day and He redoes, He rebuilds, He adds on to the temple of Zerubbabel. If you go back and study this, He remodels this temple. Remember again, God says, I'll do the work. He expands the grounds. It, it now covers uh, 35 acres. This temple that was built in Zerubbabel's day. This temple that Haggai is talking about back here. 500 years later, Herod comes along and he adds, he remodels that same temple. Oh, it wasn't much to look at then. Oh, listen, they thought back then it ain't good enough. It ain't very much. But watch it. Hear me now. It was to that temple that those people built that Joseph and Mary brought the Lord Jesus when he was eight days old uh, to, to dedicate him to God. Hey, it was to that temple they came when Jesus was 12 years old. And remember, they lost him and they went back to Luke 4 and there was Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, teaching and answering questions in what temple? Hey, in that temple that they had built. Hey, it was in that temple that the Prince of Peace came, God in the flesh, and He overturned the tables of the money changers who were taking advantage of the temple. Hey, it was in that temple that Jesus, watch me now, Jesus, on the 21st day of the 7th month, if you go to the Gospel of John, that, that, that on that great day of the feast, watch me, the very same day that Haggai gave these words, the word of the Lord came to God's people through the very Son of God, and Jesus stood in that temple that they had built and said, I am the living water. He that thirsts and let him come to me and drink. It was to that temple, God says. Oh, you listen to me. The desire of all nations would come to that temple. It was in the temple built in the days of Zerubbabel. Watch me, that didn't seem like much. That's where Jesus Christ would stand. God said the glory of that temple will be greater than the glory of the former temple. Why? Because God was with them. Why? Because God was working. God was working. Oh, you hear me, friend. You do your best. You keep on going. If we'll obey God's commands and keep on serving and keep on working and keep on going, you can rest assured that God will work. Never hear me. Never think that your best when serving God is not good enough. That's what God requires. I want to tell you something. You say, well, preacher... I'm giving my best, and I've been giving my best for a long time. And it just seems like that God isn't working. I can't see Him working. Did you know those people that built that temple way back in Haggai? I said, let me get out of here. And uh, that, that those people that built that temple way back in Haggai's day when they said it's not good enough, did you know they never saw God's Word? They never saw it. 
It was 500 years later. But God was still working. I want to tell you something, preachers. You keep giving your best and you keep serving. And when it seems like your best is not good enough, you realize that God is with me. He's with me because I'm doing His work. And you remember that God is at work. And some of the greatest blessings of your ministry you may never see. You may never see. It may be a little child. I uh, went out to eat, Pastor Ruiz, Sunday. A lady from a, a church out in the country outside of Iloilo. I went to preach there in the morning. And she after after I preached to about, there was about 40 people I think that were there. And we got finished and we got in the car, her vehicle. And thank God she had air conditioning. And uh, it was a nice vehicle, like a new vehicle. We got in there. She took it. She said, where do you want to go eat? And I said, oh, it doesn't matter. I said, we'll just eat anywhere. We can go to Jolly Bee, McDonald's. She said, no, 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 no. I, you want to go to a Thai restaurant? You want to go to a Filipino restaurant? I said, it doesn't matter. Whatever you want, it doesn't matter. She took us, I guess, to the most fancy restaurant, Iloilo. It was a Filipino place, really fancy place. And, and we went in there and I said, okay, well, this is where you want to eat. And I wasn't going to argue with it, you know. We sat down and we started eating. And after we got done uh, eating... I said to her, I said, you want me to help you with the meal? I know it was expensive because it was myself and some of the other group, people from California. And, and I think her brother was there and some other people, the pastor from that church there and other people. And I said, can I help you with the, with the payment? And she started to cry. And she said, no, sir. She said, I'm saved because of American missionaries. She said, when I was four years old, in Manila, an American missionary came and he ran a jeep to my house. She said, I came to church and I heard the gospel. She said, I'm so thankful that some American missionary came. She's serving God in that church, helping out in the church, teaching. Listen, that former pastor, he's not there anymore, that American pastor, he never saw that. He didn't enjoy, listen, he didn't enjoy the meal I did. But that was because of God working through him. Amen. You know, some of, the, some of the greatest blessings of our ministry we may never see. Yeah. These people were working and building and giving yes. their best. And God says one of these days, the glory of that house is going to be greater than the former house. Why? Because Jesus Christ Himself, the God, the God man, God in the flesh is going to stand in that temple that you're building. And He's going to declare, Come unto me, all you that are thirsty and drink. I am the water of life. When your best doesn't seem like it's good enough, keep on going. Don't quit. You pastors, don't quit. Keep on serving. Keep on working. It's not about you and I. Hear me. It's not about what you and I can do. It's about what God can do through us. And God will respond to our obedience and our faith. And when we trust God and we look at what we build and say it's not very much, God says, I'm working. I'm working. I'm with you. <laughs> say it with me. God is with me. Uh, say it. God is with me. Say this. God is working. Don't quit. When your best doesn't seem like it's good enough, don't despair. Don't quit. What a great truth. The Bible's a great book, isn't it? What a great book. What an encouraging book. Every head thought, every act close, Pastor.